part two chapter seven of a raw youth this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a raw youth by fyodor dostoyevsky translated by constance garnet part two chapter seven one i waked up at eight o'clock in the morning instantly locked my door sat down by the window and began thinking so i sat till ten o'clock the servant knocked at my door twice but i sent her away at last at eleven o'clock there was a knock again i was just going to shout to the servant again but it was liza the servant came in with her brought me in some coffee and prepared to light the stove it was impossible to get rid of the servant and all the time fekla was arranging the wood and blowing up the fire i strode up and down my little room not beginning to talk to liza and even trying not to look at her the servant as though on purpose was inexpressibly slow in her movements as servants always are when they notice they are preventing people from talking liza sat on the chair by the window and watched me your coffee will be cold she said suddenly i looked at her not a trace of embarrassment perfect tranquillity and even a smile on her lips such are women i thought and could not help shrugging my shoulders at last the servant had finished lighting the stove and was about to tidy the room but i turned her out angrily and at last locked the door tell me please why have you locked the door again liza asked i stood before her liza i never could have imagined you would deceive me like this i exclaimed suddenly though i had never thought of beginning like that and instead of being moved to tears an angry feeling which was quite unexpected stabbed me to the heart liza flushed she did not turn away however but still looked straight in my face wait liza wait oh how stupid i've been but was i stupid i had no hint of it till everything came together yesterday and for what could i have guessed it before from your going to madame stolbaev's and to that daria onisimovna but i looked upon you as the sun liza and how could i dream of such a thing do you remember how i met you that day two months ago at his flat and how we walked together in the sunshine and rejoiced had it happened then had it she answered by nodding her head so you were deceiving me even then it was not my stupidity liza it was my egoism more than stupidity the egoism of my heart and maybe my conviction of your holiness oh i have always been convinced that you were all infinitely above me and now this i had not time yesterday in one day to realize in spite of all the hints and besides i was taken up with something very different yesterday at that point i suddenly thought of katerina nikolaevna and something stabbed me to the heart like a pin and i flushed crimson it was natural that i could not be kind at that moment but what are you justifying yourself for you seem to be in a hurry to defend yourself arcady what for liza asked softly and gently though her voice was firm and confident what for what am i to do now if it were nothing but that question and you ask what for i don't know how to act i don't know how brothers do act in such cases i know they go with pistols in their hands and force them to marry i will behave as a man of honour ought only i don't know how a man of honour ought to behave why because we are not gentlefolk and he's a prince and has to think of his career he won't listen to honest people like us we are not even brother and sister but nondescript illegitimate children of a house serf without a surname and princes don't marry house serfs oh it's nauseating and what's more you sit now and wonder at me i believe that you are very much distressed said liza flushing again but you are in too great a hurry and are distressing yourself too great a hurry why do you think i have not been slow enough is it for you liza to say that to me i cried completely carried away by indignation at last and what shame i have endured and how that prince must despise me it's all clear to me now and i can see it all like a picture 
he quite imagined that i had guessed long ago what his relation was to you but that i held my tongue or even turned up my nose while i bragged of my honour that's what he may well have thought of me and that i have been taking his money for my sister for my sister's shame it was that he loathed so and i think he was quite right too to have every day to welcome a scoundrel because he was her brother and then to talk of honour it would turn any heart to stone even his and you allowed it all you did not warn me he despised me so utterly that he talked of me to stebelkov and told me yesterday that he longed to get rid of us both Verislav and me and stabelkov too anna andreevna is as much your sister as lizaveta makarovna and then he shouted after me my money's better than his and i i insolently lolled on his sofa and forced myself on his acquaintances as though i were an equal damn them and you allowed all that most likely darzen knows by now judging at least by his tone yesterday evening every one every one knew it except me no one knows anything he has not told any one of his acquaintances and he could not liza added and about stebelkov all i know is that stebelkov is worrying him and that it could only have been a guess on stebelkov's part anyway i have talked to him about you several times and he fully believed me that you know nothing and i can't understand how this happened yesterday oh i paid him all i owed him yesterday anyway and that's a load off my heart liza does mother know of course she does why yesterday she stood up for you against me oh liza is it possible that in your heart of hearts you think yourself absolutely right that you really don't blame yourself in the least i don't know how these things are considered nowadays and what are your ideas i mean as regards me your mother your brother your father does Versilov know mother has told him nothing he does not ask questions most likely he does not want to ask he knows but does not want to know that's it it's like him well you may laugh at a brother a stupid brother when he talks of pistols but your mother surely you must have thought liza that it's a reproach to mother i have been tortured by that idea all night mother's first thought now will be it's because i did wrong and the daughter takes after the mother oh what a cruel and spiteful thing to say cried liza while the tears gushed from her eyes she got up and walked rapidly towards the door stay stay i caught her in my arms made her sit down again and sat down beside her still keeping my arm round her i thought it would be like this when i came here and that you would insist on my blaming myself very well i do blame myself it was only through pride i was silent just now and did not say so i am much sorrier for you and mother than i am for myself she could not go on and suddenly began crying bitterly don't liza you mustn't i don't want anything i can't judge you liza what does mother say tell me has she known long i believe she has but i only told her a little while ago when this happened she said softly dropping her eyes what did she say she said bear it liza said still more softly ah liza yes bear it don't do anything to yourself god keep you i'm not going to she answered firmly and she raised her eyes and looked at me don't be afraid she added it's not at all like that liza darling all i can see is that i know nothing about it but i've only found out now how much i love you there's only one thing i can't understand liza it's all clear to me but there's one thing i can't understand at all what made you love him how could you love a man like that that's the question and i suppose you've been worrying yourself all night about that too said liza with a gentle smile stay liza that's a stupid question and you are laughing laugh away but one can't help being surprised you know you and he you are such opposite extremes i have studied him he's gloomy suspicious perhaps he is very good-hearted he may be but on the other hand he is above all extremely inclined to see evil in everything though in that he is exactly like me he has a passionate appreciation for what's noble that i admit but i fancy it's only in his ideal oh he is apt to feel remorse he has been all his life continually 
cursing himself and repenting but he will never reform that's like me too perhaps thousands of prejudices and false ideas and no real ideas at all he is always striving after something heroic and spoiling it all over trifles forgive me liza i'm a fool though i say this and wound you and i know it i understand it it would be a true portrait smiled liza but you are too bitter against him on my account and that's why nothing you say is true from the very beginning he was distrustful with you and you could not see him as he is but with me even at luga he has had no eyes for any one but me ever since those days at luga yes he is suspicious and morbid and but for me he would have gone out of his mind and if he gives me up he will go out of his mind or shoot himself i believe he has realized that and knows it liza added dreamily as though to herself yes he is weak continually but such weak people are capable at times of acting very strongly how strangely you talked about a pistol arcady nothing of that sort is wanted and i know what will happen it's not my going after him it's his coming after me mother cries and says that if i marry him i shall be unhappy that he will cease to love me i don't believe that unhappy perhaps i shall be but he won't cease to love me that's not why i have refused my consent all along it's for another reason for the last two months i've refused but to-day i told him yes i will marry you our kasha do you know yesterday her eyes shone and she threw her arms round my neck he went to anna andreyevna's and told her with absolute frankness that he could not love her yes he had a complete explanation with her and that idea's at an end he had nothing to do with the project it was all prince nikolay ivanovitch's notion and it was pressed upon him by those tormentors stebokov and someone else and to-day for that i've said yes dear arcady he is very anxious to see you and don't be offended because of what happened yesterday he's not quite well this morning and will be at home all day he's really unwell arcady don't think it's an excuse he has sent me on purpose and told me to say that he needs you that he has a great deal he must tell you and that it would be awkward to say it here in your lodging well good-bye oh arcady i am ashamed to say it as i was coming here i was awfully afraid that you would not love me any more i kept crossing myself on the way and you've been so good and kind i shall never forget it i'm going to mother and you try and like him a little won't you i embraced her warmly and told her i believe liza you're a strong character and i believe that it's not you who are going after him but he who is going after you only only what made you love him that's the question liza put in with her old mischievous laugh pronouncing the words exactly as i had done that's the question and as she said it she lifted her forefinger exactly as i do we kissed at parting but when she had gone my heart began to ache again two i note merely for myself there were moments after liza had gone when a perfect host of the most unexpected ideas rushed into my mind and i was actually quite pleased with them well why should i bother i thought what is it to me it's the same with every one or nearly so what of it if it has happened to liza am i bound to save the honour of the family i mention all these details to show how far i was from a sound understanding of the difference between good and evil it was only feeling save me i knew that liza was unhappy that mother was unhappy and i knew this by my feeling when i thought of them and so i felt that what had happened must be wrong now i may mention beforehand that from that day right up to the catastrophe of my illness events followed one another with such rapidity that recalling them now i feel surprised myself that i was able to stand up against them crushing as they were they clouded my mind and even my feelings and if in the end i had been overwhelmed by them and had committed a crime i was within an ace of it the jury might well have acquitted me but i will try to describe it all in the exact order of events though i forewarn the reader that there was little order in my thoughts at that time 
events came rushing on me like the wind and my thoughts whirled before them like the dead leaves in autumn since i was entirely made up of other people's ideas where could i find principles of my own when they were needed to form independent decisions i had no guide at all i decided to go to see prince sergey that evening that we might be perfectly free to talk things over and he would be at home till evening but when it was getting dark i received again a note by post a note from stebelkoff it consisted of three lines containing an urgent and most persuasive request that i would call on him next morning at eleven o'clock on most important business and you will see for yourself that it is business thinking it over i resolved to be guided by circumstances as there was plenty of time to decide before to-morrow it was already eight o'clock i should have gone out much earlier but i kept expecting versaloff i was longing to express myself to him and my heart was burning but versaloff was not coming and did not come it was out of the question for me to go to see my mother and liza for a time and besides i had a feeling that versaloff certainly would not be there all day i went on foot and it occurred to me on the way to look in at the restaurant on the canal side where we had been the day before sure enough versaloff was sitting there in the same place i thought you would come here he said smiling strangely and looking strangely at me his smile was an unpleasant one such as i had not seen on his face for a long time i sat down at the little table and told him in full detail about the prince and liza and my scene with prince sergey the evening before i did not forget to mention how i had won at roulette he listened very attentively and questioned me as to prince sergey's intention to marry liza pauvre enfant she won't gain much by that perhaps but very likely it won't come off though he is capable of it tell me as a friend you knew it i suppose had an inkling of it my dear boy what could i do in the matter it's all a question of another person's conscience and of feeling even though only on the part of that poor girl i tell you again i meddled enough at one time with other people's consciences a most unsuitable practice i don't refuse to help so far as i'm able and if i understand the position myself and you my dear boy did you really suspect nothing all this time but how could you i cried flaring up how could you if you'd a spark of suspicion that i knew of liza's position and saw that i was taking money at the same time from prince sergey how could you speak to me sit with me hold out your hand to me when you must have looked on me as a scoundrel for i bet anything you suspected i knew all about it and borrowed money from prince sergey knowingly again it's a question of conscience he said with a smile and how do you know he added distinctly with unaccountable emotion how do you know i wasn't afraid as you were yesterday that i might lose my ideal and find a worthless scamp instead of my impulsive straightforward boy i dreaded the minute and put it off why not instead of indolence or duplicity imagine something more innocent in me stupid perhaps but more honourable que diable i am only too often stupid without being honourable what good would you have been to me if you had had such propensities to persuade and try to reform in that case would be degrading you would have lost every sort of value in my eyes even if you were reformed and liza are you sorry for her i am very sorry for her my dear what makes you think i am so unfeeling on the contrary i will try my very utmost and you what of your affair never mind my affair i have no affairs of my own now tell me why do you doubt that you'll marry her he was at anna andreyevna's yesterday and positively refused that is disowned the foolish idea that originated with prince nikolai ivanitch of making a match between them he disowned it absolutely yes when was that and from whom did you hear it he inquired with interest i told him all i knew hm he pronounced it as it were dreamily and pondering 
then it must have happened just about an hour before another exclamation hm oh well of course such an interview may have taken place between them although i know that nothing was said or done either on his side or on hers though of course a couple of words would be enough for such an explanation but i tell you what it's strange he laughed suddenly i shall certainly interest you directly with an extraordinary piece of news if your prince did make his offer yesterday to anna andreevna and suspecting about liza i should have done my utmost to oppose his suit entre nous soit dit anna andreevna would in any case have refused him i believe you are very fond of anna andreevna you respect and esteem her that's very nice on your part and so you will probably rejoice on her account she is engaged to be married my dear boy and judging from her character i believe she really will get married while i well i give her my blessing of course going to be married to whom i cried greatly astonished ah guess i won't torment you to prince nikolay ivanovitch to your dear old man i gazed at him with open eyes she must have been cherishing the idea for a long time and no doubt worked it out artistically in all its aspects he went on languidly dropping out his words one by one i imagine this was arranged just an hour after prince sergey's visit you see how inappropriate was his dashing in she simply went to prince nikolay ivanovitch and made him a proposal what made him a proposal you mean he made her a proposal oh how could he she did she herself though to be sure he is perfectly ecstatic they say he is simply sitting now wondering how it was the idea never occurred to him i have heard he has even taken to his bed from sheer ecstasy no doubt listen you are talking so ironically i can hardly believe it and how could she propose to him what did she say i assure you my dear boy that i am genuinely delighted he answered suddenly assuming a wonderfully serious air he is old of course but by every law and custom he can get married as for her again it's a matter of another person's conscience as i have told you already my dear boy however she is quite competent to have her own views and make her own decision but the precise details and the words in which she expressed herself i am not in a position to give you my dear boy but no doubt she was equal to doing it in a way which neither you nor i would have imagined the best of it all is that there's nothing scandalous in it it's all très comme il faut in the eyes of the world of course it's quite evident that she was eager for a good position in the world but you know she deserves it all this my dear boy is an entirely worldly matter and no doubt she made her proposal in a magnificent and artistic style it's an austere type my dear boy the girl nun as you once described her the cool young lady has been my name for her a long time past she has almost been brought up by him you know and has seen more than one instance of his kindly feeling towards her she assured me some time ago that she had such a respect for him and such a high opinion of him such feeling for him and such sympathy with him and all the rest of it so that i was to some extent prepared i was informed of all this this morning in her name and at her request by my son her brother andrei andreevitch whom i believe you don't know and whom i see regularly twice a year he respectfully approves of the step she has taken then it is public already good heavens i am amazed no it's certainly not public yet not for some time i don't know i am altogether out of it in fact but it's all true but now katerina nikolaevna what do you think it won't suit Bering's taste will it i don't know actually that he will dislike it but you may be sure that on that side anna andreevna is a highly respectable person for what a girl she is yesterday morning immediately before this she inquired of me whether i were in love with the widow amakoff do you remember i told you of it yesterday with surprise it would have been impossible for her to marry the father if i had married the daughter do you understand now 
oh to be sure i cried but could anna andreyevna really have imagined that you could possibly want to marry katerina nikolaevna evidently she could my dear boy but however i believe it's time for you to go where you were going my head aches all the time you know i'll tell them to play lucia i love the solemnity of, of its dreariness but i've told you that already i repeat myself unpardonably perhaps i'll go away from here though i love you my dear boy but good-bye whenever i have a headache or toothache i thirst for solitude a line of suffering came into his face i believe now he really was suffering with his head his head particularly till to-morrow i said why till to-morrow and what is to happen to-morrow he said with a wry smile i shall go to see you or you come to see me no i shan't come to you but you'll come running to me there was something quite malevolent in his face but i had no thoughts to spare for him what an event three prince sergey was really unwell and was sitting alone with his head wrapped in a wet towel he was very anxious to see me but he had not only a headache he seemed to be aching morally all over to anticipate events again all that latter time right up to the catastrophe it was somehow my fate to meet with people who were one after another so excited that they were all almost mad so that i couldn't help being infected with the same malady myself i came i must confess with evil feelings in my heart and i was horribly ashamed too of having cried before him the previous night and anyway lies and he had so clearly succeeded in deceiving me that i could not help seeing myself as a fool in short my heart was vibrating on false notes as i went in but all this affectation and false feeling vanished quickly i must do him the justice to say that his suspiciousness had quickly disappeared that he surrendered himself completely he betrayed almost childish affection confidence and love he kissed me with tears and at once began talking of the position yes he really did need me his words and the sequence of his ideas betrayed great mental disorder he announced with great firmness his intention to marry liza and as soon as possible the fact that she is not of noble birth does not trouble me in the least believe me he said to me my grandfather married a serf girl who sang in a neighbouring landowner's private theatre my family of course had rested certain expectations upon me but now they'll have to give way and it will not lead to strife i want to break with my present life for good for good to have everything different everything new i don't understand what made your sister love me but if it had not been for her i should not have been alive to this day i swear from the depth of my soul that my meeting her at luga was the finger of providence i believe she loved me because i had fallen so low can you understand that though arkady makarovitch perfectly i declared in a voice of full conviction i sat at the table and he walked about the room i must tell you the whole story of our meeting without reserve it began with a secret i had guarded in my heart of which she alone heard because only to her could i bring myself to trust it and to this day no one else knows it i went to luga then with despair in my heart and stayed at madame stolbiev's i don't know why seeking solitude perhaps i had only just resigned my commission in the regiment which i had entered on my return from abroad after my meeting with andrei petrovitch out there i had some money at the time and in the regiment i led a dissipated life and spent freely while well, the officers my comrades did not like me though i tried not to offend any one and i will confess it to you no one has ever liked me there was a certain cornet stepanov i must admit an extremely empty-headed worthless fellow not distinguished in any way there was no doubt he was honest though he was in the habit of coming to see me and i did not stand on ceremony with him he used to sit in a corner mute but dignified for days together and he did not get in my way at all one day i told him a story that was going the round with many foolish additions of my own such as that the colonel's daughter was in love with me and that the colonel had his eye upon me for her and so would do anything to please me in short i will pass over the details but it led to a very complicated and revolting scandal 
it was not stepanoff who spread it but my orderly who had overheard and remembered it all for i had told an absurd story compromising the young lady so when there was an inquiry into the scandal and this orderly was questioned by the officers he threw the blame on stepanoff that is he said that it was to stepanoff i told the story stepanoff was put in such a position that he could not deny having heard it it was a question of honour and as two-thirds of the story had been lying on my part the officers were indignant and the commanding officer who had called us together was forced to clear the matter up at this point the question was put to stepanoff in the presence of all had he heard the story or not and at once he told the whole truth well what did i do then i a prince whose line goes back a thousand years i denied it and told stepanoff to his face that he was lying in the most polite way suggesting that he had misunderstood my words and so on i'll leave out the details again but as stepanoff came to me so often i was able with some appearance of likelihood to put the matter in such a light that he might seem to be plotting with my orderly for motives of his own and this told in my favour stepanoff merely looked at me in silence and shrugged his shoulders i remember the way he looked at me and shall never forget it then he promptly resigned his commission but how do you suppose it ended every officer without exception called on him and begged him not to resign a fortnight later i too left the regiment no one turned me out no one suggested my re-signing i alleged family reasons for my leaving the army that was how the matter ended at first i didn't mind and even felt angry with them i stayed at luga made the acquaintance of lizaveta makarovna but a month afterwards i began to look at my revolver and to think about death i looked at everything gloomily arkady makarovitch i composed a letter to the commanding officer and my former comrades with a full confession of my lie and the vindication of stepanov's honour when i had written the letter i asked myself the question should i send it and live or should i send it and die i should never have decided that question chance blind chance brought me near to lizaveta makarovna after a strange and rapid conversation with her she had been at madame sobiev's before that we had met and parted with bows and had rarely spoken i suddenly told her everything it was then she held out a hand to me how did she settle the question i didn't send the letter she decided that i should not send it she argued that if i did send the letter i should of course have been doing an honourable action sufficient to wash away all the filth of the past and far more but she doubted my having the strength to endure it it was her idea that no one would have the strength to bear it for then the future would be utterly ruined and no new life would be possible it is true stepanov had suffered for it but he had been acquitted by public opinion as it was it was a paradox of course but she restrained me and i gave myself into her hands completely her reasoning was jesuitical but feminine i cried she had begun to love you already it was my regeneration into a new life i vowed to change to begin a new life to be worthy of myself and of her and this is how it has ended it has ended in my going with you to roulette in my playing pharaoh i could not resist the fortune i was delighted at being in the swim delighted with all these people with race horses i tortured liza to my shame he rubbed his forehead with his hand and walked up and down the room we are both you and i stricken by the same russian curse arkady makarovitch you don't know what to do and i don't know what to do if a russian deviates ever so little from the rut of routine laid down for him by tradition at once he is at a loss what to do while he's in the rut everything's clear income rank position in society a carriage visits a wife but ever so little off it and what am i a leaf fluttering before the wind i don't know what to do for the last two months i have striven to keep in the rut i have liked the rut i've been drawn to the rut you don't know the depth of my downfall here i love liza but at the same time i've been thinking of madame amakoff is it possible i cried in distress 
by the way what did you say yesterday about Versilov's having instigated you to behave in a mean way to katerina nikolaevna i may have exaggerated it and perhaps i have been unfair to him in my suspiciousness as i have been to you let us drop the subject why do you suppose that i have not been brooding over a lofty ideal of life all this time ever since luga perhaps i swear that ideal has never left me it has been with me continually and has lost none of its beauty in my heart i remembered the vow i made to lizaveta makarovna to reform when andrei petrovitch talked about the aristocracy to me yesterday he said nothing new i can assure you my ideal is firmly established a few score acres and only a few score for i have scarcely anything left of the fortune then absolutely complete abandonment of the world and a career a rural home a family and myself a tiller of the soil or something of the sort oh in our family it's nothing new my uncle my grandfather too till the soil with their own hands we have been princes for a thousand years as aristocratic and as ancient a name as the rohans but we are beggars and this is how i will train my children remember always all your life that you are a nobleman that the sacred blood of russian princes flows in your veins but never be ashamed that your father tilled the soil with his own hands he did it like a prince i should not leave them property nothing but that strip of land but i would bring them up in the loftiest principles that i should consider a duty oh i should be helped by liza by work by children oh how we have dreamed of this together dreamed of it here in this room and would you believe it at the same time i was thinking of madame amakoff and of the possibility of a worldly and wealthy marriage though i don't care for the woman in the least and only after what nash chokin said about brewing i resolved to turn to anna andreyevna but you went to decline the match that was an honourable action anyway i suppose you think so he stopped short before me no you don't know my nature or else there is something i don't know myself because it seems i have more than one nature i love you sincerely arkady makarovitch and besides i am terribly to blame for the way i have treated you for the last two months and so i want you as liza's brother to know all this i went to anna andreyevna to make her an offer of marriage not to disown the idea is it possible but liza told me i deceived liza tell me please you made a formal offer and anna andreyevna refused it was that it was that it the facts are of great importance to me prince no i did not make an offer at all but that was only because i hadn't time she forestalled me not in direct words of course though the meaning was clear and unmistakable she delicately gave me to understand that the idea was henceforth out of the question so it was the same as your not making her an offer and your pride has not suffered how can you reason like that my own conscience condemns me and what of liza whom i have deceived and meant to abandon and the vow i made to myself and my forefathers to reform and to atone for all my ignoble past i entreat you not to tell her that perhaps that is the one thing she would not be able to forgive me i have been ill since what happened yesterday and now it seems that all is over and the last of the sokolskys will be sent to prison poor liza i have been very anxious to see you all day arkady makarovitch to tell you as liza's brother what she knows nothing of as yet i am a criminal i have taken part in forging railway shares something more what you are going to prison i cried jumping up and looking at him in horror his face wore a look of the deepest gloom and utterly hopeless sorrow sit down he said and he sat down in the armchair opposite to begin with you had better know the facts it was more than a year ago that same summer that i was at elms with lydia and katerina nikolaevna and afterwards at paris just at the time when i was going to paris for two months in paris of course i was short of money and it was just then stebelkoff turned up 
though i knew him before he gave me some money and promised to give me more but asked me in return to help him he wanted an artist a draughtsman engraver lithographer and so on a chemist an expert and for certain purposes what those purposes were he hinted pretty plainly from the first and would you believe it he understood my character it only made me laugh the point is that from my school days i had an acquaintance at present a russian exile though he was not really a russian but a native of hamburg he had been mixed up in some cases of forging papers in russia already it was on this man that stebelkoff was reckoning but he wanted an introduction to him and he applied to me i wrote a couple of lines for him and immediately forgot all about it afterwards he met me again and again and i received altogether as much as three thousand from him i had literally forgotten all about the business here i have been borrowing from him all the time with i o u s and securities and he has been cringing before me like a slave and suddenly yesterday i learned from him for the first time that i am a criminal when yesterday yesterday morning when we were shouting in my study just before nashchokin arrived for the first time he had the effrontery to speak to me quite openly of anna andreyevna i raised my hand to strike him but he suddenly stood up and informed me that his interests were mine and that i must remember that i was his accomplice and in as much a swindler as he though he did not use those words that was the sense what nonsense why surely it's all imagination no it's not imagination he has been here to-day and explained things more exactly these forged documents have been in circulation a long time and are still being passed about but it seems they have already begun to be noticed of course i've nothing to do with it but you see though you were pleased to give me that little letter that's what stebelkoff told me so you didn't know of course what for or did you know i did know prince sergey answered in a low voice dropping his eyes that's to say i knew and didn't know you see i was laughing i was amused i did it without thinking for i had no need of forged documents at that time and it wasn't i who meant to make them but that three thousand he gave me then he did not put down in his account against me and i let it pass but how do you know perhaps i really am a forger i could not help knowing i am not a child i did know but i felt in a merry humour and i helped scoundrels felons helped them for money so i too am a forger oh you are exaggerating you've done wrong but you're exaggerating there's someone else in it a young man called zibielski some sort of attorney's clerk he too had something to do with these forgeries he came afterwards from that gentleman at hamburg to see me about some nonsense of course i didn't know what it was about myself it was not about those forgeries i know that but he has kept in his possession two documents in my handwriting only brief notes and of course they are evidence too i understood that to-day stebelkoff makes out that this zibielski is spoiling everything he has stolen something public money i believe but means to steal something more and then to emigrate so he wants eight thousand not a penny less to help him on his way my share of the fortune i had inherited would satisfy stebelkoff but he said zibielski must be satisfied too in short i must give up my share of the fortune and ten thousand besides that's their final offer and then they will give me back my two letters they're in collusion that's clear it's obviously absurd if they inform against you they will betray themselves nothing will induce them to give information i understand that they don't threaten to give information at all they only say we shall not inform of course but if it should be discovered then that's what they say and that's all but i think it's enough but that's not the point whatever happens and even if i had those letters in my pocket now yet to be associated with those swindlers to be their accomplice for ever and ever to lie to russia to lie to my children to lie to liza to lie to my conscience does liza know no she does not know everything it would be too much for her in her condition i wear the uniform of my regiment and every time i meet a soldier of the regiment at every second i am inwardly conscious that i must not dare to wear the uniform listen 
i cried suddenly there's no need to waste time talking about it there's only one way of salvation for you go to prince nikolay ivanitch borrow ten thousand from him ask for it without telling him what for then send for those two swindlers settle up with them finally buy back your letters and the thing is over the whole thing will be ended and you can go and till the land away with vain imaginings and have faith in life i have thought of that he said resolutely i have been making up my mind all day and at last i have decided i have only been waiting for you i will go do you know i have never in my life borrowed a farthing from prince nikolay ivanitch he is well disposed to our family and even and has come to their assistance but i i personally have never borrowed money from him but now i am determined to our family you may note is an older branch of the sokolskys than prince nikolay ivanitch's they are a younger branch collaterals in fact hardly recognized there was a feud between our ancestors at the beginning of the reforms of peter the great my great-grandfather whose name was peter too remained an old believer and was a wanderer in the forest of kostroma that prince peter married a second wife who was not of noble births so it was then these other sokolskys dropped out but i what was i talking about he was very much exhausted and seemed talking almost unconsciously calm yourself i said standing up and taking my hat go to bed that's the first thing prince nikolay ivanitch is sure not to refuse especially now in the overflow of his joy have you heard the latest news from that quarter haven't you really i've heard a wild story that he is going to get married it's a secret but not from you of course and i told him all about it standing hat in hand he knew nothing about it he quickly asked questions inquiring principally when and where the match had been arranged and how far the rumour was trustworthy i did not of course conceal from him that it had been settled immediately after his visit to anna andreyevna i cannot describe what a painful impression this news made upon him his face worked and was almost contorted and his lips twitched convulsively in a wry smile at the end he turned horribly pale and sank into a reverie with his eyes on the floor i suddenly saw quite clearly that his vanity had been deeply wounded by anna andreyevna's refusal of him the day before perhaps in his morbid state of mind he realized only too vividly at that minute the absurd and humiliating part he had played the day before in the eyes of the young lady of whose acceptance as it now appeared he had all the time been so calmly confident and worst of all perhaps was the thought that he had behaved so shabbily to liza and to no purpose it would be interesting to know for what these foppish young snobs think well of one another and on what grounds they can respect one another this prince might well have supposed that anna andreyevna knew of his connection with liza in reality her sister or if she did not actually know that she would be certain to hear of it sooner or later and yet he had had no doubt of her acceptance and could you possibly imagine he said suddenly with a proud and supercilious glance at me that now after learning such a fact i i could be capable of going to prince nikolay ivanitch and asking him for money ask him the accepted fiance of the lady who has just refused me like a beggar like a flunkey no now all is lost and if that old man's help is my only hope then let my last hope perish in my heart i shared his feeling but it was necessary to take a broader view of the real position was the poor old prince really to be looked upon as a successful rival i had several ideas fermenting in my brain i had apart from prince sergey's affairs made up my mind to visit the old man next day for the moment i tried to soften the impression made by the news and to get the poor prince to bed when you have slept things will look brighter you'll see he pressed my hand warmly but this time he did not kiss me i promised to come and see him the following evening and we'll talk we'll talk there's so much to talk of he greeted these last words of mine with a fateful smile End of part two chapter seven part two chapter eight of a raw youth this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain 
for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a raw youth by fyodor dostoyevsky translated by constance garnet part two chapter eight one all that night i dreamed of roulette of play of gold and reckonings i seemed in my dreams to be calculating something at the gambling table some stake some chance and it oppressed me all night like a nightmare to tell the truth the whole of the previous day in spite of all the startling impressions i had received i had been continually thinking of the money i had won at zerstchikoff's i suppressed the thought but i could not suppress the emotion it aroused and i quivered all over at the mere recollection of it that success had put me in a fever could it be that i was a gambler or at least to be more accurate that i had the qualities of a gambler even now at the time of writing this i still at moments like thinking about play it sometimes happens that i sit for hours together absorbed in silent calculations about gambling and in dreams of putting down my stake of the number turning up and of picking up my winnings yes i have all sorts of qualities and my nature is not a tranquil one at ten o'clock i intended to go to stebelkoff's and i meant to walk i sent matby home as soon as he appeared while i was drinking my coffee i tried to think over the position for some reason i felt pleased a moment's self-analysis made me realize that i was chiefly pleased because i was going that day to the old prince's but that day was a momentous and startling one in my life and it began at once with a surprise at ten o'clock my door was flung wide open and tatiana pavlovna flew in there was nothing i expected less than a visit from her and i jumped up in alarm on seeing her her face was ferocious her manner was incoherent and i dare say if she had been asked she could not have said why she had hastened to me i may as well say at once that she had just received a piece of news that had completely overwhelmed her and she had not recovered from the first shock of it the news overwhelmed me too she stayed however only a half a minute or perhaps a minute but not more she simply pounced upon me so this is what you've been up to she said standing facing me and bending forward ah you young puppy what have you done what you don't even know goes on drinking his coffee oh you babbler you chatterbox oh you imitation lover boys like you are whipped 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 tatiana pavlovna what has happened what is the matter is mother you will know she shouted menacingly ran out of the room and was gone i should certainly have run after her but i was restrained by one thought and that was not a thought but a vague misgiving i had an inkling that of all her vituperation imitation lover was the most significant phrase of course i could not guess what it meant but i hastened out that i might finish with stebelkoff and go as soon as possible to nikolay ivanitch the key to it all is there i thought instinctively i can't imagine how he learned it but stebelkoff already knew all about anna andreyevna down to every detail i will not describe his conversation and his gestures but he was in a state of enthusiasm a perfect ecstasy of enthusiasm over this master-stroke she is a person yes she is a person he exclaimed yes that's not our way here we sit still and do nothing but as soon as she wants something of the best she takes it she's an antique statue she is an antique statue of minerva only she is walking about and wearing modern dress i asked him to come to business this business was as i had guessed solely to ask me to persuade and induce prince sergey to appeal to prince nikolay ivanitch for a loan or it will be a very very bad look out for him though it's none of my doing that's so isn't it he kept peeping into my face but i fancy did not detect that i knew anything more than the day before and indeed he could not have imagined it i need hardly say that i did not by word or hint betray that i knew anything about the forged documents our explanations did not take long he began at once promising me money and a considerable sum a considerable sum if only you will manage that the prince should go 
the matter is urgent very urgent and that's the chief point that the matter's so pressing i did not want to argue and wrangle with him as i had done the day before and i got up to go though to be on the safe side i flung him in reply that i would try but he suddenly amazed me beyond all expression i was on my way to the door when all at once he put his arm round my waist affectionately and began talking to me in the most incomprehensible way i will omit the details of the conversation that i may not be wearisome the upshot of it was that he made me a proposition that i should introduce him to m de gatcheff since you go there i instantly became quiet doing my utmost not to betray myself by the slightest gesture i answered at once however that i was quite a stranger there and though i had been in the house it was only on one occasion by chance but if you've been admitted once you might go a second time isn't that so i asked him point-blank and with great coolness why he wanted it and to this day i can't understand such a degree of simplicity in a man who was apparently no fool and who was a business man as vassin had said of him he explained to me quite openly that he suspected that something prohibited and sternly prohibited was going on at durgatchev's and so if i watch him i may very likely make something by it and with a grin he winked at me with his left eye i made no definite answer but pretended to be considering it and promised to think about it and with that i went hastily away the position was growing more complicated i flew to vassin and at once found him at home what you too he said enigmatically on seeing me without inquiring the significance of this phrase i went straight to the point and told him what had happened he was evidently impressed though he remained absolutely cool he cross-examined me minutely it may very well be that you misunderstood him no i quite understood him his meaning was quite clear in any case i am extremely grateful to you he added with sincerity yes indeed if that is so he imagined that you could not resist a certain sum of money and besides he knows my position i have been playing all this time and behaving badly vassin i have heard about that what puzzles me most of all is that he knows you go there constantly too i ventured to observe he knows perfectly well vassin answered quite simply that i don't go there with any object and indeed all those young people are simply chatterers nothing more you have reason to remember that as well as any one i fancy that he did not quite trust me in any case i am very much obliged to you i have heard that m stebelkoff's affairs are in rather a bad way i tried to question him once more i have heard anyway of certain shares what shares have you heard about i mentioned the shares on purpose but of course not with the idea of telling him the secret prince sergey had told me the day before i only wanted to drop a hint and see from his face from his eyes whether he knew anything about shares i attained my object from a momentary indefinable change in his face i guessed that he did perhaps know something in this matter too i did not answer his question what shares i was silent and it was worth noting that he did not pursue the subject either how's lizaveta makarovna he inquired with sympathetic interest she's quite well my sister has always thought very highly of you there was a gleam of pleasure in his eyes i had guessed long before that he was not indifferent to liza prince sergey petrovitch was here the other day he informed me suddenly when i cried just four days ago not yesterday no not yesterday he looked at me inquiringly later perhaps i may describe our meeting more fully but for the moment i feel i must warn you vassin said mysteriously that he struck me as being in an abnormal condition of mind and of brain indeed i had another visit however he added suddenly with a smile just before you came and i was driven to the same conclusion about that visitor too has prince sergey just been here no not prince sergey i am not speaking of the prince just now andrei petrovitch versilov has just been here and you've heard nothing hasn't something happened to him perhaps something has but what passed between you exactly i asked hurriedly 
of course i ought to keep it secret we are talking rather queerly with too much reserve he smiled again andrei petrovitch however did not tell me to keep it secret but you are his son and as i know your feelings for him i believe i may be doing right to warn you only fancy he came to me to ask the question in case it should be necessary for him very shortly in a day or two to fight a duel would i consent to be his second i refused absolutely of course i was immensely astonished this piece of news was the most disturbing of all something was wrong something had turned up something had happened of which i knew nothing as yet i suddenly recalled in a flash how versilov had said to me the day before i shan't come to you but you'll come running to me i rushed off to prince nikolai ivanitch feeling more than ever that the key to the mystery lay there as he said good-bye vassin thanked me again two the old prince was sitting before an open fire with a rug wrapped round his legs he met me with an almost questioning air as though he were surprised that i had come yet almost every day he had sent messages inviting me he greeted me affectionately however but his answers to my first question sounded somewhat reluctant and were fearfully vague at times he seemed to deliberate and looked intently at me as though forgetting and trying to recall something which certainly ought to be connected with me i told him frankly that i had heard everything and was very glad a cordial and good-natured smile came into his face at once and his spirits rose his mistrust and caution vanished at once as though he had forgotten them and indeed he had of course my dear young friend i knew you would be the first to come and do you know i thought about you yesterday who will be pleased he will well no one else will indeed but that doesn't matter people are spiteful gossips but that's no great matter cher enfant this is so exalted and so charming but of course you know her well and anna andreevna has the highest opinion of you it's a grave and charming face out of an english keepsake it's the most charming english engraving possible two years ago i had a regular collection of such engravings i always had the intention always i only wonder why it was i never thought of it you always if i remember rightly distinguished anna andreevna and were fond of her my dear boy we don't want to hurt any one life with one's friends with one's relations with those dear to one's heart is paradise all the poets in short it has been well known from prehistoric times in the summer you know we are going to sodden and then to bad Gastein. but what a long time it is since you've been to see me my dear boy what's been the matter with you i've been expecting you and how much how much has happened meanwhile hasn't it i'm only sorry that i am uneasy as soon as i am alone i feel uneasy that is why i must not be left alone must i that's as plain as twice to make four i understood that at once from her first word oh my dear boy she only spoke two words but it was something like a glorious poem but of course you are her brother almost her brother aren't you my dear boy it's not for nothing i'm so fond of you i swear i had a presentiment of all this i kissed her hand and wept he took out his handkerchief as though preparing to weep again he was violently agitated suffering i fancy from one of his nervous attacks and one of the worst i remember in the whole course of our acquaintance as a rule almost always in fact he was ever so much better and more good-humoured i would forgive everything my dear boy he babbled on i long to forgive every one and it's a long time since i was angry with any one art la poésie dans la vie philanthropy and she a biblical beauty quel charmant personne est eh? les gens de salomon non ce n'est pas salomon c'est david qui mettait une jambe dans son lit pour se chauffer dans sa vieillesse enfin david salomon all that keeps going round in my head a regular jumble everything cher enfant may be at the same time grand and ridiculous c'est jean belle de la vieillesse de david c'est tout un poème et paul de croc would have made of it a saint de bassinois and we should all have laughed paul de croc 
has neither taste nor sense of proportion though he is a writer of talent katerina nikolaevna smiles i said that we would not trouble any one we have begun our romance and only ask them to let us finish it maybe it is a dream but don't let them rob me of this dream how do you mean it's a dream prince a dream how a dream well let it be a dream but let me die with that dream oh why talk of dying prince you have to live now only to live why what did i say that's just what i keep saying i simply can't understand why life is so short to avoid being tedious no doubt for life too is the creator's work of art in a perfect and irreproachable form like a poem of pushkin's brevity is the first essential of true art but if any one is not bored he ought to be allowed to live longer tell me prince is it public property yet no my dear boy certainly not we have all agreed upon that it's private 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 so far i've only disclosed it fully to katerina nikolaevna because i felt i was being unfair to her oh katerina nikolaevna is an angel she is an angel yes 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 and you say yes why i thought that you were her enemy too ach by the way she asked me not to receive you any more and only fancy when you came in i quite forgot it what are you saying i cried jumping up why where my presentiment had not deceived me i had had a presentiment of something of this sort ever since tatiana's visit yesterday my dear boy yesterday i don't understand in fact how you got in for orders were given how did you come in i simply walked in the surest way if you had tried to creep in by stealth no doubt they would have caught you but as you simply walked in they let you pass simplicity cher enfant is in reality the deepest cunning i don't understand did you too decide not to receive me then no my dear boy i said i had nothing to do with it that is i gave my full consent and believe me my dear boy i am much too fond of you but katerina nikolaevna insisted so very strongly so there it is at that instant katerina nikolaevna appeared in the doorway she was dressed to go out and as usual came in to kiss her father seeing me she stopped short in confusion turned quickly and went out voila cried the old prince impressed and much disturbed it's a misunderstanding i cried one moment i i'll come back to you directly prince and i ran after katerina nikolaevna all that followed upon this happened so quickly that i had no time to reflect or even to consider in the least how to behave if i had had time to consider i should certainly have behaved differently but i lost my head like a small boy i was rushing towards her room but on the way a footman informed me that katerina nikolaevna had already gone downstairs and was getting into her carriage i rushed headlong down the front staircase katerina nikolaevna was descending the stairs in her fur coat and beside her or rather arm in arm with her walked a tall and severe-looking officer wearing a uniform and a sword followed by a footman carrying his greatcoat this was the baron who was a colonel of five-and-thirty a typical smart officer thin with rather too long a face ginger moustache and even eyelashes of the same colour though his face was quite ugly it had a resolute and defiant expression i describe him briefly as i saw him at that moment i had never seen him before i ran down the stairs after them without a hat or coat katerina nikolaevna was the first to notice me and she hurriedly whispered something to her companion he slightly turned his head and then made a sign to the footman and the hall porter the footman took a step towards me at the front door but i pushed him away and rushed after them out on the steps buring was assisting katerina nikolaevna into the carriage katerina nikolaevna katerina nikolaevna i cried senselessly like a fool like a fool oh i remember it all i had no hat on buring turned savagely to the footman again and shouted something to him loudly one or two words i did not take them in i felt some one clutch me by the elbow at that moment the carriage began to move i shouted again and was rushing after the carriage i saw that katerina nikolaevna was peeping out of the carriage window and she seemed much perturbed but in my hasty movement i jostled against buring unconsciously and trod on his foot hurting him a good deal i fancy he uttered a faint cry clenched his teeth with a powerful hand grasped me by the shoulder and angrily pushed me away so that i was sent flying a couple of yards 
at that instant his great coat was handed him he put it on got into his sledge and once more shouted angrily to the footman and the porter pointing to me as he did so thereupon they seized me and held me one footman flung my great coat on me while a second handed me my hat and i don't remember what they said they said something and i stood and listened understanding nothing of it all at once i left them and ran away three seeing nothing and jostling against people as i went i ran till i reached tatiana pavlovna's flat it did not even occur to me to take a cab buring had pushed me away before her eyes i had to be sure stepped on his foot and he had thrust me away instinctively as a man who had trodden on his corn and perhaps i really had trodden on his corn but she had seen it and had seen me seized by the footman it had all happened before her before her when i had reached tatiana pavlovna's for the first minute i could say nothing and my lower jaw was trembling as though i were in a fever and indeed i was in a fever and what's more i was crying oh i had been so insulted what have they kicked you out serve you right serve you right said tatiana pavlovna i sank on the sofa without a word and looked at her what's the matter with him she said looking at me intently come drink some water drink a glass of water drink it up tell me what you've been up to there now i muttered that i'd been turned out and that buring had given me a push in the open street can you understand anything or are you still incapable come here read and admire it and taking a letter from the table she gave it to me and stood before me expectantly i had once recognized versilov's writing it consisted of a few lines it was a letter to katerina nikolaevna i shuddered and instantly comprehension came back to me in a rush the contents of this horrible atrocious grotesque and blackguardly letter were as follows word for word dear madam katerina nikolaevna depraved as you are in your nature and your arts i should have yet expected you to restrain your passions and not to try your wiles on children but you are not even ashamed to do that i beg to inform you that the letter you know of was certainly not burnt in a candle and never was in craft's possession so you won't score anything there so don't seduce a boy for nothing spare him he is hardly grown up almost a child undeveloped mentally and physically what use can you have for him i am interested in his welfare and so i have ventured to write to you though with little hope of attaining my object i have the honour to inform you that i have sent a copy of this letter to baron buring a versilov i turned white as i read then suddenly i flushed crimson and my lips quivered with indignation he writes that about me about what i told him the day before yesterday i cried in a fury so you did tell him cried tatiana pavlovna snatching the letter from me but i didn't say that i did not say that at all good god what can she think of me now but it's madness you know he's mad i saw him yesterday when was the letter sent it was sent yesterday early in the day it reached her in the evening and this morning she gave it me herself but i saw him yesterday myself he's mad versilov was incapable of writing that it was written by a madman who could write like that to a woman that's just what such madmen do write in a fury when they are blind and deaf from jealousy and spite and their blood is turned to venom you did not know what he is like now they will pound him to a jelly he has thrust his head under the axe himself he'd better have gone at night to the nikolaevsky railway and have laid his head on the rail they'd have cut it off for him if he's weary of the weight of it what possessed you to tell him what induced you to tease him did you want to boast but what hatred what hatred i cried clapping my hand on my head and what for what for of a woman what has she done to him what can there have been between them that he can write a letter like that hatred tatiana pavlovna mimicked me with furious sarcasm the blood rushed to my face again all at once i seemed to grasp something new i gazed at her with searching inquiry get along with you she shrieked turning away from me quickly and waving me off i've had bother enough with you all i've had enough of it now you may all sink into the earth for all i care your mother is the only one i'm sorry for i ran of course to versilov but what treachery what treachery for versilov was not alone to explain the position beforehand 
after sending that letter to katerina nikolaevna the day before and actually dispatching a copy of it to baron Buring, god only knows why naturally he was bound to expect certain consequences of his action in the course of to-day and so had taken measures of a sort he had in the morning moved my mother upstairs to my coffin together with liza who as i learned afterwards had been taken ill when she got home and had gone to bed the other rooms especially the drawing-room had been scrubbed and tidied up with extra care and at two o'clock in the afternoon a certain baron r did in fact make his appearance he was a colonel a tall thin gentleman about forty a little bald of german origin with ginger-coloured hair like Beering's, and a look of great physical strength he was one of those baron r's of whom there are so many in the russian army all men of the highest baronial dignity entirely without means living on their pay and all zealous and conscientious officers i did not come in time for the beginning of their interview both were very much excited and they might well be versilov was sitting on the sofa facing the table and the baron was in an armchair on one side versilov was pale but he spoke with restraint dropping out his words one by one the baron raised his voice and was evidently given to violent gesticulation he restrained himself with an effort but he looked stern supercilious and even contemptuous though somewhat astonished seeing me he frowned but versilov seemed almost relieved at my coming good morning baron this is the very young man mentioned in the letter and i assure you he will not be in your way and may indeed be of use the baron looked at me contemptuously my dear boy versilov went on i am glad that you have come indeed so sit down in the corner please till the baron and i have finished don't be uneasy baron he will simply sit in the corner i did not care for i had made up my mind and besides all this impressed me i sat down in the corner without speaking as far back as i could and went on sitting there without stirring or blinking an eyelid till the interview was over i tell you again baron said versilov rapping out his words resolutely that i consider katerina nikolaevna amakoff to whom i wrote that unworthy and insane letter not only the soul of honour but the acme of all perfection such a disavowal of your own words as i have observed to you already is equivalent to a repetition of the offence growled the baron your words are actually lacking in respect and yet it would be nearest the truth if you take them in their exact sense i suffer do you see from nervous attacks and nervous ailments and am in fact being treated for them and therefore it has happened in one such moment these explanations cannot be admitted i tell you for the third time that you are persistently mistaken perhaps purposely wish to be mistaken i have warned you from the very beginning that the whole question concerning that lady that is concerning your letter to madame amakoff must be entirely excluded from our explanation you keep going back to it baron buring begged and particularly charged me to make it plain that this matter concerns him only that is your insolence in sending him that copy and the postscript to it in which you write that you are ready to answer for it when and how he pleases but that i imagine is quite clear without explanation i understand i hear you do not even offer an apology but persist in asserting that you are ready to answer for it when and how he pleases but that would be getting off too cheaply and therefore i now in view of the turn which you obstinately will give to your explanation feel myself justified on my side in telling you the truth without ceremony that is i have come to the conclusion that it is utterly impossible for baron buring to meet you on an equal footing such a decision is no doubt advantageous for your friend baron buring and i must confess you have not surprised me in the least i was expecting it i note in parenthesis it was quite evident to me from the first word and the first glance that verslas was trying to lead up to this outburst that he was intentionally teasing and provoking this irascible baron and was trying to put him out of patience the baron bristled all over i have heard that you are able to be witty but being witty is very different from being clever an extremely profound observation colonel i did not ask for your approbation cried the baron i did not come to bandy words with you be so good as to listen baron buring was in doubt how to act when he received your letter because it was suggestive of a madhouse 
and of course means might be taken to suppress you however owing to certain special considerations your case was treated with indulgence and inquiries were made about you it turns out that though you have belonged to good society and did at one time serve in the guards you have been excluded from society and your reputation is dubious yet in spite of that i have come here to ascertain the facts personally and now to make things worse you don't scruple to play with words and inform me yourself that you are liable to nervous attacks it's enough baron buring's position and reputation are such that he cannot stoop to be mixed up in such an affair in short i am authorized sir to inform you that if a repetition or anything similar to your recent action should follow hereafter measures will promptly be found to bring you to your senses very quickly and very thoroughly i can assure you we are not living in the jungle but in a well-ordered state you are so certain of that my good baron confound you cried the baron suddenly getting up you tempt me to show you at once that i am not your good baron ach i must warn you once again said versaloff and he too stood up that my wife and daughter are not far off and so i must ask you not to speak so loud for your shouts may reach their ears your wife the devil i am sitting here talking to you solely in order to get to the bottom of this disgusting business the baron continued as wrathfully as before not dropping his voice in the least enough he roared furiously you are not only excluded from the society of decent people but you're a maniac a regular raving maniac and such you've been proved to be you do not deserve indulgence and i can tell you that this very day measures will be taken in regard to you and you will be placed where they will know how to restore you to sanity and will remove you from the town he marched with rapid strides out of the room versaloff did not accompany him to the door he stood gazing at me absent-mindedly as though he did not see me all at once he smiled tossed back his hair and taking his hat he too made for the door i clutched at his hand ah yes you are here too you heard he said stopping short before me how could you do it how could you distort disgrace with such treachery he looked at me intently his smile broadened and broadened till it passed into actual laughter why i've been disgraced before her before her they laughed at me before her eyes and he and he pushed me away i cried beside myself really ah poor boy i am sorry for you so they laughed at you did they you are laughing yourself you are laughing at me it amuses you he quickly pulled his hand away put on his hat and laughing laughing aloud went out of the flat what was the use of running after him i understood and i had lost everything in one instant all at once i saw my mother she had come downstairs and was timidly looking about her has he gone away i put my arms around her without a word and she held me tight in hers mother my own surely you can't stay let us go at once i will shelter you i will work for you like a slave for you and for liza leave them all all and let us go away let us be alone mother do you remember how you came to me at two shards and i would not recognize you i remember my own i have been bad to you all your life you were my own child and i was a stranger to you that was his fault mother it was all his fault he has never loved us yes yes he did love us let us go mother how could i go away from him do you suppose he is happy where's liza she's lying down she felt ill when she came in i'm frightened why are they so angry with him what will they do to him now where's he gone what was that officer threatening nothing will happen to him mother nothing does happen to him or ever can happen to him he's that sort of man here is tatiana pavlovna ask her if you don't believe me here she is tatiana pavlovna came quickly into the room good-bye mother i will come to you directly and when i come i shall ask you the same thing again i ran away i could not bear to see any one let alone tatiana pavlovna even mother distressed me i wanted to be alone alone five but before i had crossed the street i felt that i could hardly walk and i jostled aimlessly heedlessly against the passers-by feeling listless and adrift but what could i do with myself what use am i to any one and what use is anything to me now mechanically i trudged to prince sergey's though i was not thinking of him at all he was not at home i told piotr his man that i would wait in his study as i had done many times before his study was a large one a very high room cumbered up with furniture 
i crept into the darkest corner sat down on the sofa and putting my elbows on the table rested my head in my hands yes that was the question what was of any use to me now if i was able to formulate that question then i was totally unable to answer it but i could not myself answer the question or think about it rationally i have mentioned already that towards the end of those days i was overwhelmed by the rush of events i sat now and everything was whirling round like chaos in my mind yes i had failed to see all that was in him and did not understand him at all was the thought that glimmered dimly in my mind at moments he laughed in my face just now that was not at me it was all buring then not me the day before yesterday he knew everything and he was gloomy he pounced on my stupid confession in the restaurant and distorted it regardless of the truth but what did he care for the truth he did not believe a syllable of what he wrote to her all he wanted was to insult her to insult her senselessly without knowing what for he was looking out for a pretext and i gave him the pretext he behaved like a mad dog does he want to kill buring now what for his heart knows what for and i know nothing of what's in his heart no no i don't know even now can it be that he loves her with such passion or does he hate her to such a pitch of passion i don't know but does he know himself why did i tell mother that nothing could happen to him what did i mean to say by that have i lost him or haven't i she saw how i was pushed away did she laugh too or not i should have laughed they were beating a spy a spy what does it mean suddenly flashed on my mind what does it mean that in that loathsome letter he puts in that the document has not been burnt but is in existence he is not killing buring but is sitting at this moment no doubt in the restaurant listening to lucia and perhaps after lucia he will go and kill buring buring pushed me away almost struck me did he strike me and buring disdains to fight even versaloff so would he be likely to fight with me perhaps i ought to kill him to-morrow with a revolver waiting for him in the street i let that thought flit through my mind quite mechanically without being brought to a pause by it at moments i seemed to dream that the door would open all at once that katerina nikolaevna would come in would give me her hand and we should both burst out laughing oh my student my dear one i had a vision of this or rather an intense longing for it as soon as it got dark it was not long ago i had been standing before her saying good-bye to her and she had given me her hand and laughed how could it have happened that in such a short time we were so completely separated simply to go to her and to explain everything this minute simply simply good heavens how was it that an utterly new world had begun for me so suddenly yes a new world utterly utterly new and liza and prince sergey that was all old here i was now at prince sergey's and mother how could she go on living with him if it was like this i could i can do anything but she what will be now and the figures of liza anna andreevna stebelkov prince sergey avradov kept disconnectedly whirling round in my sick brain but my thoughts became more and more formless and elusive i was glad when i succeeded in thinking of something and clutching at it i have my idea i thought suddenly but have i don't i repeat that from habit my idea was the fruit of darkness and solitude and is it possible to creep back into the old darkness oh my god i never burnt that letter i actually forgot to burn it the day before yesterday i will go back and burn it in a candle in a candle of course only i don't know if i am thinking properly it had long been dark and piotr brought candles he stood over me and asked whether i had had supper i simply motioned him away an hour later however he brought me some tea and i greedily drank a large cupful then i asked what time it was it was half-past eight and i felt no surprise to find i had been sitting there five hours i have been in to you three times already said piotr but i think you were asleep i did not remember his coming in i don't know why but i felt all at once horribly scared to think i had been asleep i got up and walked about the room that i might not go to sleep again at last my head began to ache violently at ten o'clock prince sergey came in and i was surprised that i had been waiting for him i had completely forgotten him completely you were here and i have been round to you to fetch you he said to me his face looked gloomy and severe and there was not a trace of a smile there was a fixed idea in his eyes i have been doing my very utmost all day and straining every nerve he said with concentrated intensity everything has failed and nothing in the future but horror note well he had not been to prince nikolay ivanitch's 
i have seen zibielski he is an impossible person you see to begin with we must get the money then we shall see and if we don't succeed with the money then we shall see i have made up my mind not to think about that if only we get hold of the money to-day to-morrow we shall see everything the three thousand you want is still untouched every farthing of it it's three thousand all except three roubles after paying back what i lent you there is three hundred and forty roubles changed for you take it another seven hundred as well to make up a thousand and i will take the other two thousand then let us both go to zertchikov and try at opposite ends of the table to win ten thousand perhaps we shall do something if we don't win it then this is the only way left anyhow he looked at me with a fateful smile yes yes i cried suddenly as though coming to life again let us go i was only waiting for you i may remark that i had never once thought of roulette during those hours but the baseness the degradation of the action prince sergey asked suddenly our going to roulette why that's everything i cried money's everything why you and i are the only saints while buring has sold himself anna andreyevna sold herself and versilov have you heard that versilov's a maniac a maniac a maniac are you quite well arkady makarovitch your eyes are somehow strange you say that because you want to go without me but i shall stick to you now it's not for nothing i've been dreaming of play all night let us go let us go i kept exclaiming as though i had found the solution to everything well let us go though you're in a fever and there he did not finish his face looked heavy and terrible we were just going out when he stopped in the doorway do you know he said suddenly that there is another way out of my trouble besides play what way a princely way what's that what's that you'll know what afterwards only let me tell you i'm not worthy of it because i have delayed too long let us go but you remember my words we'll try the lackey's way and do you suppose i don't know that i am consciously of my own free will behaving like a lackey six i flew to the roulette table as though in it were concentrated all hopes of my salvation all means of escape and yet as i have mentioned already i had not once thought of it before prince sergey's arrival moreover i was going to gamble not for myself but for prince sergey and with his money i can't explain what was the attraction but it was an irresistible attraction oh never had those people those faces those croupiers with their monotonous shouts all the details of the squalid gambling saloon seemed so revolting to me so depressing so coarse and so melancholy as that evening i remember well the sadness and misery that gripped my heart at times during those hours at the gambling table but why didn't i go away why did i endure and as it were accept this faith this sacrifice this devotion i will only say one thing i can hardly say of myself that i was then in my right senses yet at the same time i had never played so prudently as that evening i was silent and concentrated attentive and extremely calculating i was patient and niggardly and at the same time resolute at critical moments i established myself again at the zero end of the table that is between zertchikov and afridov who always sat on the former's right hand the place was distasteful to me but i had an overwhelming desire to stake on zero and all the other places at that end were taken we had been playing over an hour at last from my place i saw prince sergey get up from his seat and with a pale face move across to us and remain facing me the other side of the table he had lost all he had and watched my play in silence though he probably did not follow it and had ceased to think of play at that moment i just began winning and zertchikov was counting me out what i had won suddenly without a word afridov with the utmost effrontery took one of my hundred rouble notes before my very eyes and added it to the pile of money lying before him i cried out and caught hold of his hand then something quite unexpected happened to me it was as though i had broken some chain that restrained me as though all the affronts and insults of that day were concentrated in that moment in the loss of that hundred rouble note it was as though everything that had been accumulating and suppressed within me had only been waiting for that moment to break out he's a thief he has just stolen my hundred roubles i exclaimed looking round beside myself i won't describe the hubbub that followed such a scandal was a novelty there at zertchikov's people behaved with propriety and his saloon was famous for it but i did not know what i was doing zertchikov's voice was suddenly heard in the midst of the clamour and din but the money's not here and it was lying here four hundred roubles another scene followed at once the money in the bank had disappeared under zertchikov's very nose 
a roll of four hundred roubles zertchikoff pointed to the spot where the notes had only that minute been lying and that spot turned out to be close to me next to the spot where my money was lying much closer to me than to aphrodite the thief is here he has stolen it again search him i cried pointing to aphrodite this is what comes of letting in all sorts of people thundered an impressive voice in the midst of the general uproar persons have been admitted without introduction who brought him in who is he a fellow called dolgoruki prince sokolsky brought him cried some one listen prince i yelled to him across the table in a frenzy they think i'm a thief when i've just been robbed myself tell them about me tell them about me and then there followed something worse than all that had happened that day worse than anything that had happened in my life prince sergey disowned me i saw him shrug his shoulders and heard him in answer to a stream of questions pronounced sharply and distinctly i am not responsible for any one please leave me alone meanwhile aphrodite stood in the middle of the crowd loudly demanding that he should be searched he kept turning out his own pockets but his demands were met by shouts of no no we know the thief two footmen were summoned and they seized me by my arms from behind i won't let myself be searched i won't allow it i shouted pulling myself away but they dragged me into the next room there in the midst of the crowd they searched me to the last fold of my garments i screamed and struggled he must have thrown it away you must look on the floor some one decided where can we look on the floor now under the table he must have somehow managed to throw it away of course there's no trace i was let out but i succeeded in stopping in the doorway and with senseless ferocity i shouted to be heard by the whole saloon roulette is prohibited by the police i shall inform against you all to-day i was led downstairs my hat and coat were put on me and the door into the street was flung open before me End of part two chapter eight